Vim is an incredibly powerful text editor, and one of the reasons why it is, is because of the way it handles macros. So today we're going to have a look at how to set them up and some of the things that you've got to be wary of while you're doing that. So if you're new to this channel, remember to subscribe and ding the little bell icon down below because it'll really help the channel out. I'm trying to hit 100 subs by the end of the month and it is getting very close to doing it. If we gain one a day for the rest of the month, we're going to hit the goal. So any help be really appreciated. So now that's out of the way, let's get started. Good afternoon everyone and welcome back to the channel. So I'm going to assume that you have some sort of understanding of how Vim actually works. So I'm not going to explain what each of the modes are, but we will go over them just so I can explain how mappings actually work. So I will basically go over what they are before we go into actually how the mappings are structured. So I found this Stack Overflow article which basically sums everything up pretty well. So you can bind keys for normal mode, visual and select mode, Operator pending. So operator pending is when you do something like Y and then you can say Y, I, or you do D and you do D, I, bracket, something like that. Then you've got visual only, which is visual mode, obviously, select mode, insert mode only, command line mode, and that is basically anything that you write on the little thing on the bottom. So if you press colon W, that's in command line mode, or colon whatever the thingy to search for your text is. I can't remember what it is because I've got it bound to something. And then you've also got L, which is insert, command line, regex search, and that is just generally called the langarg pseudo mode. So now that that's out of the way, let's bring up Vim. Basically the way that a macro is structured, it's quite simple actually. So the way that it works is a macro is in three parts. So you've got the type of macro you're setting up, the keys that it's bound to, and then what the macro is itself. And the lovely thing about Vim macros is that the entire macro, the part that is put in there when you press your key binding, is just literally what you write there. So we'll take a one later down in my VimRC. So let's say, for example, this one. So when I press semicolon G, it will write out this literal right here. So less than, plus, plus, greater than, or whatever, you, you can read the signs. And basically, the, the reason that's so great is because it makes writing macros incredibly easy. So one thing I do want to get out of the way is that you actually can completely brick Vim if you decide to do it. So I'll go out right up to the top, just so we have a nice spot to work with, so I'll make a bit of space here. So the reason I say that you can completely brick Vim, so for example, what would happen if we did something like map I, which is the key to enter insert mode, and then let's just map that to anything else. Let's map that to, let's say, Q. What will happen if we do that? So bring up a new window of Vim, we press I, and we can no longer enter insert mode. So, the thing you need to be very, very wary of if you're mapping over keys that already have meaning within Vim is that you can completely brick Vim if you are not paying attention to what you're doing. So, if you're going to bind over keys that are bound to something within the application, make sure you check what they actually do. But if you do want to troll someone, then I guess that is also an option. So, if we just close that out now, we can actually in enter insert mode now. Okay, so one of the coolest things about Vim is that you have the ability to do recursive and non-recursive macros. So basically what I mean by this is that, so a non-recursive macro is it'll stop after you've run one command, whereas a recursive macro will keep chaining commands until it either runs out of commands to chain or it hits a macro that's not recursive. So if we do something like say, let's do a insert mode map, We'll map the letter L to, I don't know, let's map it to KK. And we map a, another letter, let's say we map K to A, A. And then we map, say, A to, I don't know, let's map it to G. So what will happen here is the first macro will run when we press L. So it'll print out two Ks. And that'll cause the next macro to run, which will then replace each of those Ks with two As. And then the next macro will run, which will cause all of the A's to be replaced by G's. So if I bring up another window, I can actually show you that. So we run L, and as we can see, we've now got four G's on the screen. 
And one of the very few checks that Vim actually does do is it'll stop you doing infinitely recursive macros. So if we instead of say replacing A with G, we replace it with L. So we'll see what happens when we try to do that. So we'll bring up another Vim window. And basically when we press L, it'll complain that we've got a recursive mapping. So it does do a very basic check to make sure you're not going to just crash the application instantly. But as I said earlier, you can brick the application in other ways if you really want to do it. So those letters I showed earlier were actually very important. So as we can see now, we've got an I here. So that's saying it's an insert mode map, but we can also do something like say a normal mode map. So if we change this from I to N, now, as we'll see when we open up this and we run L, it won't run the last part of the command. Actually, actually, it's not even going to be a problem there. So we've got a recursive mapping in here if we had left it on insert mode, but we've moved it to another mode. So now it's not actually going to treat that as part of the previous mapping chain that we had. So we press L and as we can see, it prints out four A's, but it doesn't run this last mapping that we have here. And that's because that has a meaning in a different mode now. So we can see now if we press A, that'll act like an L key. So you can have mappings that are bound to the same keys as long as they are bound within different modes. If you try to map them within the same mode, what's going to happen is it's going to use the latest version of the binding, I'm pretty sure. I don't believe it'll stop you doing that. I think it'll just use the latest version of it. So by looking at the way these letters work, you may think that you could actually chain these letters together, but you can't actually do that. So you can't do something like you want insert mode and normal mode on this one mapping. That isn't allowed. So if you do want to have the same macro for multiple different modes and there's no generic mode for that, you have to just repeat it, which is a little annoying, but it's also there as a safety measure, I guess. And maybe there's a plugin for it. I actually don't know. There could be, if someone knows about one where you can actually just chain these letters together and make your macros a bit easier to write, let me know and I'll pin the comment. As it stands, you can't do that. So right now we've only looked at recursive mappings, so how do you do a mapping that isn't recursive? Because there's a lot of times when you don't want them to be recursive. Pretty much all you have to do is after the letter, write no re, and then that'll say that this command isn't recursive. So if we remove this and we say, put that back to a letter that's not gonna crash the application. Now, if we run this, what we'll see happen is that it'll run this first part and it'll run this second part, but it won't run this last part, I'm pretty sure. As we can see, it's run this first part where it's printed out the two Ks. It's then replaced the two Ks with two As, and it stopped there because this isn't a recursive mapping. So once it's run this command, that stops the chain. So we can also see if we run K, that'll just stop instantly printing the two As. So you may have seen this leader thing down here and you might be wondering what exactly is that key? Because obviously there's no leader key on your keyboard. So basically what that is, is a generic key that you can set up that you can use for a lot of your different macros. So the way you set that is you write let map leader equals and then whatever key you want it bound to. And I've got it bound to space. So basically a lot of my macros, when I press space and then something else, I can then use that. Obviously you can bind it to pretty much anything that you want. There's obviously gonna be some exceptions and someone will let me know what they are probably, but most keys you can set it to. So for example, we've got this mapping here to run GoYo. Actually, my webcam is probably in the way. We'll move it up there. So if we press space and then G, that'll run GoYo. And then if we press space and then capital G, that'll turn it off. So the reason you want to use this is so that you can segregate some of your macros from different macros on your keyboard. So it just gives you a generic way to reference different keys. And a nice thing about this is if you use leader key as opposed to something else, like say you wanna start having your macros on the space bar, but one day you decide, maybe I don't want that. Maybe I want them on colon. Then you can, actually colon is a bad idea because then you won't be able to enter command line mode. You want them on semicolon, for example. You don't then have to go and actually update your macros. If you've got everything bound to leader, then you can just update your leader key and all of your macros are then updated automatically. And that just saves you a bit of time. So there's some other keys in here that you might not have noticed. So this CR in brackets, that just basically means carriage return. 
So we've got this binding here, which basically means control R. So if you put C dash and then a character, that just basically means control. So here we've got control and W. I guess you could use capital. I don't know why I've used both, doesn't matter. I know that they're both control though. Then I've also got space here. Then for the arrow keys, you can do whatever direction they are. So left, right, you know what the arrow keys are. I think that's all the special keys really are. Ah, we've also got escape and tab. So anything else, I don't think I'm using, but there's probably bindings for them for something in Vim. So if you want to check those out, then go ahead. But these are the ones you're most likely going to be using. So escape, tab, control, something, and carriage return, which is your enter key. If there's anything else, then go and look them up, but you're probably not going to be using anything else besides those. So at this point, you probably have a sort of understanding of what the different modes that you can do stuff in and the fact that you can have your macros as literals that you write out into your VimRC. But you might be wondering what one of the practical benefits of doing this is. So if we look at one of my bindings in here, we've got this binding for just generic files and I can turn them into scripts basically. So to do that I add a shebang to the top of the file. So in normal mode we can press space B and then that will print out a shebang. And this then leads me on to something that I wasn't planning to go over in this video but it actually is important just to go over the basics of. And that is one of the auto commands that is very important for doing macros. And that is auto command file type. So what this lets you do is segregate your different macros into different file types so they are only run when you're in that sort of file. So a benefit of doing this is if you want to have different macros for different programming languages for example like I've got something here for shell, for HTML, LaTeX, Markdown, some of those aren't programming languages obviously they are markup languages but I can have bindings that are then bound to the same keys. So if there's concepts that are similar across the different sort of markup languages, I can then mirror the macros between each of the different languages. So for example, we've got this one in HTML, which lets me print out an H1 tag and Markdown has a equivalent. And that is basically a hash. So I've got them bound to the exact same key. So the way that this auto command works is it, it's very simple. So you write out auto command, then file type, that is the command that you're running, and then the type of file that you're running it on. So for example, if you want to run it on a shell file or a, a shell script file, you write sh. Or if you want to do it on a HTML file, you can write in HTML. Or for markdown, you can do, where is it? You can do markdown. And then LaTeX, you've got text and LaTeX files. So by doing this, as I said, you can have these keys that are bound to the same things. So if you have concepts that are similar across the different markup languages or different programming languages, you can have them bound to the same things. Or if you just want to bind everything to the same keys and they have completely different meanings, you can do that. But this lets you then segregate those different keys so they actually become accessible in that other language without then overriding what you've got for a different language. So I guess before I go, I can actually show you what some of my shell bindings are so I can give you some examples of things that you could do with it. So if we just save this file, we save it as, I don't know, script dot, actually no, we're not even gonna bother putting a shower in there because we've got the shebang at the top. So if we close that, and if I bring it back open, the, what, what, I, don't ask me why I just forgot what the name was. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> So we can do something like, let's say we want to add a if statement, so comma i, and then we've got this if statement that's auto-generated, so we wanna, doesn't matter what we put in here, and then I have a binding where I can jump between these different guides that I have in here. So a guide is something like this. So if I press space tab, that'll jump me to the next guide, and then I can press space tab again, that'll jump me out. And I can do things like, let's say I want to write a function, for example, and then that'll then automatically generate that structure for me. And it should put me in insert mode, but I haven't got that set up right now, apparently. So we can name the function func, I guess, bad name, and then jump inside of it and write some stuff, then jump outside of it, write some more stuff. So hopefully that gives you a sort of idea of how that could actually speed up your workflow. So if you don't have to worry about actually writing these basic constructs yourself and then just worry about what you want to write in the language, it makes it a bit quicker. And one of the greatest things about writing Vim macros yourself is that you're not worrying about someone else's perfect way of using Vim. You come up with your perfect way of using it 
And even if nobody else can use it, if it makes you quicker at using the application, then that's obviously going to be for the best. So I could probably go over all of my bindings and spend all day going about it, but I think that you guys have a relatively solid baseline to work from here. If you want to learn more, I'll leave some useful resources in the description down below. And I think that you guys should actually be able to work from them now because the hardest thing is just getting that first step. Once you've got that first step, I think that you can actually get somewhere from there. So if you like this video, remember to smash that like button and leave me a comment down below letting me know what you think. If you want to see more videos like this, let me know and I'll be happy to make them because I actually do enjoy doing stuff like this because it actually makes me go and properly learn how this stuff works. And if you want to see those videos when they come out, remember to subscribe and ding the little bell icon down below because it'll really help the channel out. And up on that corner there will be a playlist that this video is in. It'll either be... Linux Rising or Linux Tutorials. I reckon probably Linux Tutorials, but I'll find out when I actually go and upload it. And one last thing before I go, if you want a pretty good Vim tutorial, go check out my mate Tamor Ahmed. He did a video on it a few weeks back now, and I thought it was a pretty good video. It's only about 12 minutes long, and it'll teach you most of the basics you need for Vim. So if you don't know them, go check that out. And I think that is now pretty much everything for me, so I'm out.